فادعوه بها وذروا الذين يلحدون في أسمائه سيجزون ما كانوا يعملون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته the name with which we will begin with today, inshallah, is Al Malik, or Al Malik, or Al Ladil Al Mulk, which is on page 5 of your booklets. Uh, Al Malik has been translated here as the king, and Al Malik has been translated as the master and owner. Al Ladil Al Mulk, which is more of a description rather than a name, the one to whom belongs the dominion. The author, rahimahullah, he says, he is described with the attribute of the master and owner. These are attributes of grandeur, majesty, omnipotence, and regulation of the affairs of creation. The one who directs all of the affairs to do with creation, command and recompense, and to whom belongs the whole of creation, all of it is subservient, owned, and in continuous need of him. And then he quotes the verses from the Quran, then high above be all will be Allah, the true King. And be not in haste with the Quran before its revelation is completed, and say, My Lord, increase me in knowledge. Say, O oh Allah, owner of the dominion, you give the kingdom to whom you will, and you take the kingdom from whom you will. You endure with honor whom you will, and you humiliate whom you will. In your hand is the good, indeed you are able to do all things. We will start with the first name, Al-Malik. And Al-Malik is a name which appears in the Qur'an five times. As for Al-Malik, then this is a name which appears uh, one time in the Qur'an. And likewise, there's another name as well, which the author hasn't mentioned here, which is similar in meaning, which is Al-Malik. Al-Malik which is also mentioned one time in the Qur'an, which is a slightly more intensive meaning uh, than Al-Malik. Now all these names, they, they, they come from the same root word, Malaka. And Malaka, which is the verb, Malaka Yamliku. This in standard or traditional, you can say Arabic, has the meaning to own something. So someone who owns something, we say he's Malik. Even we use this um, in our day-to-day -day language, even for non-Arabs, we know we have the Malik of a shop, isn't it? The shop owner, we, call, we say he's Malik. Someone who owns something is, which is generally considered to be Malik. However, if we look in more detail, we find how the Arabs, they use this, this phrase Malika for uh, other purposes as well. One major purpose for Malaka was to indicate someone's strength and ability. Strength and ability. Al-Qudra, Al-Quwa, Al-Izza, Might and Honor. Al-Ilm al muhit encompassing knowledge. Because all of these things necessitate kingship and ownership. When someone has a lot of power, a lot of ability, a lot of might, extensive knowledge, then these are the qualities that you usually associate with a, with, a, with a supreme king. Likewise, extensive wisdom as well. So this is one major feature of someone who possesses uh, mulk. Likewise, another important feature of the verb malaka, obviously if you, if you uh, if you're an owner of something, that means you have something under your possession. You have, you have certain things that belong to you. And these things that belong to you, they are in need of you. 
they are in need of you. So when we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Malik, this obviously implies that all of the creation belong to him. And that all of creation are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya ayyuhal nas, antumul fuqara'u ila Allah. Allahu wa al-ghaniyu al-hameed. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Fatir, O mankind, antumul fuqara'u ila Allah. You are in a state of poverty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he owns us, he regulates our affairs, and therefore we are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thirdly, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, it's the, he's the king, he's the owner of everything, and everything is subject to his will, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the one who governs the affairs of his slaves. If you own and possess something, you usually regulate the affairs of that particular thing that you own. For example, if you have a car, you're in charge of that car, you take care of it, you look after it, you service it, clean it, etc. If it didn't belong to you, you wouldn't really do that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has what we call tadbir, organization, regulation of the affairs of creation. And there are three areas that the scholars mention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He regulates the affairs of creation. <coughs> and this is what the author alluded to here um, in the second sentence. He says, the one who directs all of the affairs to do with creation, command and recompense. So these are three areas. Creation, command and recompense. Now, Creation, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can create whatever He wills in terms of physical things, He creates whatever He wishes, but also in terms of events and circumstances. Everything happens by the decree of Allah. So when we say Allah is Malik or Malik, that means He didn't just create this universe, but all the things that even occur is part of the creation of Allah. Even the actions that we do, that's actually from the creation of Allah. Allah created you and what your hands do and your handiwork essentially. This doesn't mean that we are uh, that we have been stripped from free will because Allah has given us free will. Whoever wills amongst you to be steadfast. So Allah has given us free will, but obviously that is governed by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's given us the ability at the end of the day to do whatever we will to do. If I, for example, intend to pick this up, I have willed that, but Allah gave me that ability to do that by giving me the strength and the power. So Allah created that action in that sense. Not that he has forced me to do it, he's given me my free will. So to Allah belongs al-khalq, creation. So he created each one of us and he created all the events that take place. And that has ramifications and consequences which we will discuss in Shalom. He also has the command, al am He has the command, meaning he has the command to decide what is right and what is wrong. And nahi wal am Allah can prohibit whatever he wishes and he can command whatever he wishes. This belongs to Allah. And this is like if you are a king in this worldly sense. You are the one who dictates the do's and the don'ts in society. So when we say Allah is Malik or Malik, then to him belongs Al-Hukum wal am To him belongs the commandment to decide what to do and what not to do. We do not have a secular belief with regards to Allah that Allah simply created the dunya and he left the dunya as it is and we decide for ourselves what to do in life. No. When we say Allah is Malik, He's Malik of the dunya, as well as the fact that He's Malik of Yom al Deen as well. And thirdly, Allah's dominion, His kingship, also, this is the third area, recompense. Recompense in the hereafter, in particular. 
Allah decides, if he's a king, then he decides who goes to paradise and who goes to the hellfire. This is the decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one can contest that, no one can challenge the decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Allah is Malik Yawmiddin. The day he is the king and the master of this day of recompense. And this is the ayah we will speak about in more detail later, inshallah ta'ala. So these are the three major areas where we can see the, the kingship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What he has control over, and what he sustains and what he regulates. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described this in a, in a beautiful hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, wa ta'ala al-arda yawm al qiyamati that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will grasp the entire earth on the day of judgment with His right hand. And He will fold up the heavens with His right hand and then He will say, أَنَا الْمَلِكَ أَيْنَ مُلُوكُ الْأَرْضِ أَيْنَ الْجَبَّارُ That I am the king, where are the kings of the earth? Where are those proud and haughty people? And as Abdullah ibn Umar mentioned you know, in one version of this hadith, that when Rasulullah was saying this hadith, his minbar, his pulpit was shaking. Meaning that the, the body of Rasulullah, his body was shaking when he was saying this hadith out of awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a, a very strong statement. I am the king. Where are the kings of the earth? Now, if we reflect upon this statement, it will make us understand the essential difference between the mulk of Allah and the mulk of creation. The things that Allah is a king over and what we are kings and rulers over. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has attributed mulk to creation, we can possess things, we have milk, we have ownership of certain things. But this ownership, number one, is temporal. It's not a permanent form of ownership, because when we die, we cannot take our possessions with us. In fact, the two major forms of uh, wealth in Arabic, gold and silver. Gold we say in Arabic is dhahab and silver is fiddha. If you look at the, the meaning of these words, dhahab, dhahab comes from the word dhahaba which means to go. Fiddha comes from the word fadda and in fadda which means to disperse and to, to, to run away from. And why do they say this? It's because when you die your dhahab is going to go away from you. From you. يَذْهَبُ عَنْكَ And your silver is going to flee away from you. So whatever you possess in this dunya, you are not going to possess it on the day of judgment. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٌ On that day, neither wealth or children will avail you, will not help you, except to the one who came to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his sound heart. So therefore, if we recognize that our possessions we are not going to be possessing them forever then our relationship with our possessions should reflect that our relationship with our wealth should reflect that so if you knew something that you are going to use on a temporary basis you're not going to be what attached to it you know, if you're borrowing something, for example, if you rented a car or you borrowed an item from someone, you know, eventually you have to give it back. So you tell yourself, I can enjoy it while I, whilst I have it, but I shouldn't go grow too attached to it. You shouldn't grow too attached to it. And this is a famous story, of course, I mentioned in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, Rahimahullah. There was a very pious man from Bani Israel who was known for being a devout worshiper. And his wife passed away. 
and he was very fond of his wife and he had great love for his wife. After she passed away, he began to, he went into seclusion, people didn't really see him and people became, you know, obviously very concerned about his state, his emotional state, his mental state. And so what happened, a woman, an average woman, she came to this scholar and worshipper and she had a question for him. And so she said to him, I have this, this necklace I borrowed from my, from my neighbor and the time has come for me to give it back. But I don't want to give it back. I like it so much. Can I keep it? He said, no, of course you can't. You don't own it. You have to return it back to its rightful owner. And so she turned around to the sheikh and said, you also need to return what was yours back to the rightful owner. And this is the meaning of the phrase, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. To Allah we what belong, and to Him we shall return. So don't become so attached. Because this, these things that we possess, it's not really ours in the, in the first place. This is all the mulk of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even our bodies. That's why our bodies have rights over us. Why? Because Allah has stated that these are the rights you know, of your body over you. Because Allah owns our bodies. Allah has purchased the souls of the believers. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala owns us. That's the amazing thing. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala owns us. So this is an important thing we need to reflect on. That Allah, everything in this dunya, it belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It all belongs to Allah. So we have to be extremely careful with the way we treat this dominion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As soon as we disconnect our belief that Allah is Al-Malik and Al-Malik, this is when corruption spreads upon the earth and people view wealth as their own possession, they become attached to it and this is when fasad, corruption spreads upon the earth because they, they are the kings and this is what Allah will say, no, an Al-Malik, I am the king, Aina Muruq al where are the kings of the earth because they were not truly kings in that sense. Another important di distinction and uh, difference between the kingship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that of man is that when a king from this worldly life, when he, is to, when he gives something away from his possessions, then naturally his possessions will decrease. But whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives, that will not decrease from his dominion anything. And that's why Rasul said in the famous hadith, لو أن أولكم وآخركم وإنسكم وجنكم قاموا في صعيد واحد. If the first of you and the last of you, the ins of you, the human of you, and the jinn of you, all stood in one platform, and they were to ask me, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, Allah, He said, I will give everything, مسألته. I will give everything that everyone wants. And that will not decrease my dominion in anything. Illa, except he gives an analogy. Illa kama yankusul mikhyatu idha udkhil al bahr. Except if a mikhyat, a needle, was to be placed into a sea. And what would you see? If you were to take this needle out, obviously the needle will be wet, isn't it? But has that really decreased the amount of water in the sea? No, not at all. So that's the difference between our ownership and the ownership of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now another important feature about this kingship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that His is a kingship of mercy. Now whenever you hear the phrase king, usually you associate with that, in many cases, negative connotations. It's like for example when you hear the word dictator. Do you think positive word, positive force when you think of hear the word dictator? No. But when we say the word Malik and Malik, 
And that's why even Islamic terminology, it's not good to really you know, have these terms. Malik and... You know, in fact, the Prophet ﷺ forbade people to use the term, to refer to a human being as Malik al-Muluk, the King of Kings. Because Allah is Malik al-Muluk. We have Amir al-Mu'mineen, Khalifa, etc. But really, to refer to a leader as a king, then this is setting yourself up to challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not really befitting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in Surah Al Furqan, verse 26, Al Mulku Yawma Idin Al Haqqu Lil Liman, Lil Rahman. The dominion on that day, in truth, will belong to who? Al Rahman, the Most Merciful. And so there's an association of Rahman, of mercy, with the dominion and the, the kingship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is to really soothe the feelings of the people that although we say Allah is Malik Yawmiddin, and He is Malik, this obviously will strike a lot of fear into the heart of the believer, but at the same time we should understand that His kingship it, and, 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 and His ownership over us is that of mercy and justice. For Allah is not dhallam lil abid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not unjust to his servants. And that's why the scholars would say, Al Malik la yahsunu wa la yakmuru illa ma'al ihsani wa rahma. Kingship and being a leader over somebody, a person doesn't reach the level of perfection in that unless he has, he shows kindness and mercy. And that's true. And that's the ideal leadership, not just in terms of the heavens and the earth, but even amongst human beings. As soon as you strip mercy and justice away from leadership, then this is when corruption spreads. This is when hatred develops between the leadership and those who are ruled over. And this is exactly what we're seeing in the Muslim world today. Why do we see Muslims uprising against their rulers? It's because of this fact. <coughs> that they have abused their leadership and they have stripped their leadership away from any form of rahmah and any form of justice. But this is why we say that the, the kingship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely contrary uh, to them. We know the famous hadith about the seven people who will be under the shade of Allah on a day there is no shade except His shade. We know many of them. One in particular, though, is an Imam al adi the just ruler. Other ones we know, for example, as I mentioned, the, the young Shab who was enticed by a woman, but he fears Allah. He said, I fear Allah. Another person who grows, grows up, his heart attached to the masjid. Another Shab, another, uh, 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 another person who gives charity with his right hand such that his left hand doesn't know. All of these have common features. All of these seven people have one common feature, which is the ability to resist temptations. The ability to resist temptations. Al-Imam al adil the just ruler, because when you become a ruler, what happens? You amass wealth, power, authority, which in many cases leads to what? Exactly what's happening in the Muslim world today. Oppression, injustice, greed, dictatorship, abuse of power. It's very easy to fall into that. So whenever you possess something and own it, and you think it all belongs to you, that is all yours, that is what leads to corruption. But Allah reminds us, قُلِ اللَّهُ مَالِكُ الْمُلْكُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a verse that he mentions in, in the book, uh, in chapter 3, verse 26. Malikul Mulk, say, O Allah, owner of the dominion, tu'til mulka man tasha, that you give the kingdom to whom you will, and you take the kingdom from who you will. And notice the word to take, ten zero, from the word naza'a, which literally means to, to take apart from the deep roots of something. وَالنَّازِعَاتِ غَرْقًا نَزَعًا which you, 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 
go deep into something and you essentially rip it out. Allah is the one who gave that to them. Allah is the one who gave that dominion to them and He's the one that can take it away. وَتِلْكَ الْأَيَّامُ مُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these are the days that we alternate between the people. Sometimes we give people power and authority in the land. Sometimes, you know, we'll give them defeat. And so, you know, what we're seeing really today in the Muslim world, in Syria and other places, we really need to reflect on, on, on the, with regards to these incidents and, and see the dominion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what happens when people try and take this dominion of Allah and think that it belongs to them. Mankind cannot cope with uh, this dunya unless he's regulated by the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're not regulated by the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is what we call tughiyan. Allah tatagawdi bizan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Allah has created everything in a balance, so do not transgress that balance. And Islam, with its sharia, teaches us this balance. It teaches us this balance. So, the Fawalid, the benefits now, the benefits of knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, before we move on to do that actually, just a, a, a brief discussion with regards to the difference between Malik and Malik. What is the difference between Malik and Malik? Now as you know in certain qira'at, certain uh, um, recitations of the Qur'an, the Surah Al-Fatiha, uh, we recited Hafs and Asim, and take Malik, Yawmiddin, but in other qira'at, like uh, Warsh, Maliki Yawmiddin. So instead of the Alif, Maliki Yawmiddin. What's the difference? And which one is more effective? Which one is more ablaq? Which one is more effective? This is something the scholars have differed over. There is one view, as Imam al-Shawkani, he mentions that um, Malik, it's more encompassing and more uh, powerful. It's, it's a stronger way of expressing kingship. Why? Because he said, Kullu malikin malikun. Every king is an owner of something. Every king is an owner of something. However, this can be disputed today because we have like the Queen of England who doesn't really own that much in that sense in comparison to the, say, the kings and the leaders of the past. But not every owner is a king. So every king is an owner, but not every owner is a king. And that's why, for example, we use the phrase Malik, you know, amongst ourselves. Oh, he's the Malik of the Dukkan. He's the owner of the, of the shop. We're not saying he's the king of the shop, do we? We don't say that. So Malik is more intense in that sense. Malik is more intense in that sense. Others said no, the other way around. Malik, because it's very possible, as we said, it's possible that you can have a, 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 a Malik, but he doesn't really possess anything. He's a very poor Malik. A bit like the Queen today. She doesn't really have, have that much power and authority. But Malik definitely means you own something. Malik definitely means you own something. Because the active participle of the verb Malik, which definitely means you own and possess something. So just in terms of the difference between the two, uh, and something to reflect on. Okay, benefits of knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-malik or al-malik. Firstly, it necessitates that without a shadow of a doubt that we worship Him. That we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if Allah surely owns everything, this will necessitate us to worship Him. As Allah mentions with al-ma'idah, verse 76. قُلْ أَتَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَمْلِكُ لَكُمْ دَرًّا وَلَا نَفْعًا Say, do you worship other than Allah, that which does not possess for you any harm or benefit? لا يملك, it doesn't possess, doesn't own any way of benefiting you or harming you. Allah is the all-hearing and the all-knowing. وَيَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَمْلِكُ لَهُمْ رِزْقًا مِنَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ شَيْئًا 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah al nahl verse 73, and they worship other than Allah that which does not possess for them any form of provisions from the heavens. Allah owns all of that. So surely you should turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, another important benefit, knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the King of, uh, and He is the King and the owner, this has a tremendous effect on our hearts. From the a'mal al actions of the heart, this necessitates that we definitely, we, we should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because He is the one who truly owns. So you don't just depend upon your boss to provide your wages. Because you know Allah at the end of the day owns all of that. So you have reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is al man And we need to remember this, for example, with the Muslims, what they're going through in Syria now. Alhamdulillah, I think we can see this amongst the, the people there, that they realize now. That they don't need to depend upon anybody else. They just need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one who gives power and authority in the earth. So if you want to seek change, seek it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why they, they've shown clips of just going, you know, people going to an average woman. They say, we don't need America, we don't need England. We have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one who gives kingdom, the kingdom to whoever he wishes. He is the one who removes it. And we need to remember, this is a very powerful verse, which really I wanted to spend the whole lesson just looking at this verse from Surah Al Imran, especially in relation to what is happening today. But I thought, you know, due to time and you know, we've already missed a lesson. But this is really a very big deep verse and a lot of things that we can gather from it. Inshallah, one day maybe Allah give us still here to discuss this in more detail, inshallah. Another important benefit knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is Al-Malik and Al-Malik, is that all decisions in life, should refer back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether in the dunya or the akhirah. <coughs> Decisions meaning al-hukum, ruling. If Allah is al-malik and the malik, then he should decide for us what is right and wrong. We do not leave that to our own intellects and our own minds. And likewise, in addition to that, the fate of what will happen to people on the day of judgment. That's why we say, Malik yawm al-deen. He is the owner and the king of the day of recompense, Malik yawm al deen A deen comes from the verb dana, which means to repay back. Hence in Arabic, a dain is a, is, a, is a debt. When you're in debt, you've taken a loan. This is a dain, because you're going to be paid back. So yawm al deen is a day that you would be recompensed, you would be paid back. So Allah is the owner of that day. Why to reiterate the fact that we will not decide our own fate? We can't say on the day of judgment comes, I'm definitely going to paradise, I will go to paradise, or this person will go to paradise definitely, or this person will definitely go to the hellfire. This is not for us. We shouldn't even put our minds there. And the danger of um, trying to understand how Allah will place people in paradise and hellfire, in particular with regards to the hellfire, this could have a very dangerous effect on our aqidah. Because for some people, they might find it very hard to believe that certain people will spend eternity in hellfire. Now, this could arise from a number of different, uh, this could happen for a number of different reasons. For example, and I've, I've, I've mentioned this in previous lessons, I've, I discussed with a Muslim once about the fate of Diana, Princess Diana. Allah alam how she died. And we treat her as a kafirah in this dunya, but her fate is with Allah in the Akhir. That's not for us to decide. Okay, but we, in the terms of the dunya we sense, we treat her, we know that she, from what we assume, she died as a disbeliever. Now this brother, he said, you know, surely she can't go to the hellfire. She was such a good person. She did charitable works, you know, she, she wasn't known to upset other people or anything of the sort, you know. How could she go to the hellfire? Look at the danger now. If Allah has decreed, for example, that she does go to the hellfire, who are we to challenge the decision of Allah? Allah will be the malik of the day of judgment. And the danger of that is that it could change our understanding of how we are to treat people in this dunya. If someone finds it difficult how someone could spend eternity in the hellfire, then this will naturally have an effect on the way they interact with that person in the dunya. 
So they'll see someone, they'll say, oh, you know, this is Shaykh Wala and Bara, loving for the sake of Allah, hating for the sake of Allah, or showing enmity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Really, is that something that we should be, you know, it seems a bit harsh. It really seems a bit harsh. Leave that to Allah in the Akhirah. This is not for us. It's not for us to decide. And likewise, we shouldn't go around declaring people to be definitely in paradise or definitely in the hellfire. We just judge by what is apparent in this life and we treat them according to that in this life, but their faith is for Allah in the Akhirah. And sometimes this problem arises because we don't, um, we do not, uh, we have underestimated really the importance of the rights of Allah over His creation. What is the right of Allah over His creation? The right of Allah over His creation is that we worship Him. See, many people, they, they, they think, okay, it's a commandment from Allah, but they don't realize this, the, 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 the significance, the, 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 the what will happen as a result if a person doesn't fulfill this right of Allah? Eternity in the hellfire. Shirk, kufr, eternity in the hellfire. But as soon as we belittle or we treat the rights of Allah as secondary, then this is where problems like this begin to arise. And this is what we're seeing today. We live in a, in, in a society, in a civilization, where they have essentially given the, the rights of human beings a divine status above the status of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if there is ever a conflict between the right of a human being, what they understand to be a right of, of a human being, and that conflict with the right of Allah, they will throw the right of Allah in the bin. So for example, if they say, for example, according to the the, the rules of the, the, the human rights that was you know, designed by the United Nations, everyone has freedom of belief. And to a certain degree, that falls within the teachings of Islam. But Rasulullah said, Man For example, whoever changes his religion, then kill him. Meaning, if a Muslim changes his religion, then the law of apostasy must be applied on that person. But obviously, according to the, the laws of the United Nations and the Declaration of Human Rights, this is not acceptable. But whose right is greater? The right of Allah or the right of the human being? The right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is al-Malik. He is the one who decides what is right and wrong in the dunya and He is the one who will decide the fate of people in al-Akhirah. And finally, it increases the servant's desire uh, for what is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense that if a person needs something in life then he turns to Allah directly he turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly and he doesn't lower himself to the level where he starts begging other people and he thinks that provisions lie in the hands of other people Rasulullah said فَإِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهِ if you ask then ask Allah if you seek help, seek help in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَإِيَّاكَ فَاسْتَعِينُ It is you alone we worship and you alone we seek help from. So as believers, we should always seek help in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this is an important point here we need to reflect on. In this worldly life, we always need help of other human beings. If, if I need someone to help me pick up this table, you know, I need another human being to help me. Okay? Many things in life, you need the help of other human beings. Does this negate this hadith? You know, for example, if, if, if when it comes to picking up this table, I should, should I say to myself, no, it's wrong to ask a human being. So let me just ask Allah, oh Allah, help me pick up this table. How do we understand that in light of this hadith? We say that when you ask a human being to help you, realize that that human being can only help you if Allah willed it. So when you ask a human being, essentially, who are you asking? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you're, you're intending that this person can only help me by the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're still seeking the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or at least you should be. Now, brothers and sisters, so far now we have covered the names Allah, 
الرحمن الرحيم ملك المالك and all of these names appear at the beginning of Surah Al-Fatiha Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alam Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawm al and obviously Allah is one Alhamdulillah so five names these names as some scholars have said in this surah, there is a particular order that has been observed in these names. Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah. So Allah is the creator. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Rabbil Alameen. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, what did he do? He not, he, did he leave creation to, to be as a, by itself and he didn't take any part with creation? No. He nurtures the creation. He nurtures the creation, sustains creation. So he is Rabb. After creating it, he's sustaining it. Providing people with all of their things. So Allah is Rabbul Alameen. Alhamdulillah Rabbul Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. After Allah, he created and he nurtured. Then what? What was the purpose of his creation? That they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah, through his mercy, he sent down prophets and messengers so that they could be guided to the true path. He's Rahman. So after Allah mentions Rabbil Alameen, he mentioned Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. And he's Rahim. In particular, to who? <coughs> to the believers. So he's Rahman in the sense that he's given uh, revelation to everyone, Muslims and non-Muslims, but he's Rahim to the believers and he shows special care to those who eventually end up accepting this faith. And he shows them a high degree of mercy which we spoke about last week. So after Allah, he created us, he nurtured us, he showered us with his mercy by sending us revelation and he was merciful more towards the believers and he was merciful to them by forgiving them of their sins as well. What comes next? Maliki Yawmiddin. He is the owner of the day of recompense. He is the owner of that day of recompense. This is the day that Allah he will reward the believers and He will punish those who disbelieve. This is the order of Al Fatiha. Now, if you look to the last surah of the Quran, Surah Al Nas. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ إِلَهِ النَّاسِ These three names we have all covered. And these three names also appeared in Al-Fatiha. So, Alhamdulillah, رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ رَبْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Malik, Malik Yawm al-Din comes later, and likewise in this surah, Maliki al-Nas. Ilahinnas. Now, Ilahinnas comes at the end in Surah Al Fatiha, in, in the description of the names of Allah in Surah Al Nas. But in Surah Al Fatiha, where did it come? Alhamdulillah. But Allah is also indirectly mentioned later. Okay. Malik Yawm al Din, Iyak and Abudu, Wa Iyak and Astarin. It is you alone that we worship. And what's one of the meanings of Allah, as we said? The one who is worshipped. So this order has been maintained even within Surah An Nas. This order has even been attained within Surah An Nas. And if you look very carefully, these three names, nas, 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 they form the foundations of our belief in Tawheed of Allah, in the, in the oneness of Allah. What are the three types of Tawheed? Rububiyya, Rububiyya, Asma wa Sifa. Rububiyya, Allah's Lordship. Where is that found in Surah Al-Nas? Qul a'udhu bi Rabbi Nas. Uluhiyya, Ilahin Nas. The names and attributes, Maliki Nas. So really, Surah Al-Nas is a manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Tawheed. Now just to connect these two surahs very quickly, Really, if you look
look, I mean, if we, if we opt for the theory that all of the surahs in the Qur'an, uh, the, 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 the order that we read the surahs in the Qur'an today is exactly how it is in Lawhi Mahfouf, if we opt for that opinion, then really Surah Al-Nas being at the end of the, of, of the Qur'an, it's, it's subhanAllah, amazing. Because Surah Al-Fatiha, the way I want you to view the Qur'an, one way of looking at the Qur'an, Surah Al-Fatiha is the main, is the heart of the Qur'an. The rest of the Qur'an is an explanation of the Surah, and Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Al-Nas is the conclusion. Now imagine, just to illustrate this, if I've given you a task, you have to go to a certain destination. So you need to know what? You need to know how to get there. You need to know the path to take. You need to know uh, what things you need to take with you. And then finally, what do you need to know? What dangers there lie ahead of you? The dangers that lie ahead of you. In case that they will divert you away from the right path. The Quran is in essence showing you all of them. The Quran shows you the path. And that path is as sirat al mustaqim It shows you how to traverse that path throughout the Quran. The Quran explains to you how to traverse this path. And at the end, you need to seek refuge in Allah from those things that will take you and divert you away from this path. And this is why Surah Al-Nas comes, one of the reasons we can say with wisdoms, possible wisdoms, why Surah Al-Nas comes right at the end. Right at the end. And this is why I find fascinating that the issue of isti'adha, seeking refuge in Allah, we know we say it when? Before we recite Quran, isn't it? But if you look at the verse in the Quran, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانَ الرَّجِيمِ If I look at it very linguistic, if you were to translate it literally, what does it read? And when you have read the Quran, seek refuge in Allah. Although we translate it and the correct understanding and the, impl and the implementation of the verse is that it's meant that you, that you are meant to recite the Qur'an, uh, recite the isti'adha before you recite the Qur'an. But very literally in the ayah, it says, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ قَرَأْتَ is past tense. If you have read the Qur'an, seek refuge in Allah. This is to show you that the act of isti'adha, seeking refuge, doesn't just occur at the beginning, but occurs before the action, during the action, and after the action. Because you can seek refuge in Allah before you do the action, but whilst you're doing the action, believe me, shaitan is going to try and divert you. There's a shaitan that's going to try and divert you within your salah. And after you finish your salah, shaitan is going to come back to you. What's he going to say? He's going to try and put pride in your heart. Oh, you prayed an amazing <coughs> prayer. So much for sure. Okay? al Uj is going to try and put that in your heart. You know, you know Ahmed, before he passed away, shaitan came to him. When he was going for the Sakharat al -Bawl. And he said, Futtani ya Ahmad. He was biting his fingers. He said, Futtani ya Ahmad. You, you passed, you know, um, you know, you've managed to escape, escape my grip. And he said, La, not yet. Not yet. Only when my soul leaves my body, that's when I have defeated you. Imam Ahmad, look at his fiqh and his understanding of the religion. He realized Shaitan was trying to deceive him even in this moment. He was trying to put in his heart pride. Arabs. Imagine you saw that, you're dying and you think, you know, Alhamdulillah, I've defeated the shaytan. SubhanAllah, no. He is a manifest enemy to you. So, the point is, that I just wanted to kind of reflect over these names, these important names that we have discussed. And there are so many other, SubhanAllah, any jewels of knowledge that we could really, um, you know, derive uh, from these beautiful names and, and uh, uh, places that they're mentioned in the Quran. But uh, inshallah we'll take a break now and we'll resume after a few minutes. Just uh, one small fa'id and benefit on uh, the ayah that they quoted in um, page 5. The um, high above all be Allah, the true king, um, the dua that mentions at the end, وَقُلْ رَبِّي زِدْنِي عِلْمًا This is a dua, I'm sure we all were taught when we were young. Our parents told us to say it every time we enter the exam room. وَقُلْ رَبِّي زِدْنِي عِلْمًا It's a very beneficial dua. 
this, this is a very, very unique du'a. In fact, there's no other du'a like it in the Qur'an. Uh, when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for things in the Qur'an, you know, there are many du'as that, you know, Rabbana atina, oh Allah, give us. You know, Rabba hab lana, oh Allah, bestow unto us. Oh Allah, forgive us. Oh Allah, grant us, etc. Oh Allah, enter us, adkhilna. So there are many supplications like this. But this is the only supplication in the Qur'an that asks for an increase in something. وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي Oh Allah, increase me in something. And there's a difference between asking for something and asking for more of something. Okay, so I can say, can I have some water please? Okay, well, can I have some more water? Okay, that, that increase indicates that the person has a very strong and fervent desire for that thing at hand. He didn't say, oh Allah, give me knowledge. Increase me in knowledge. And this is one of the verses that the scholars spoke at great length to, to prove the great status and virtue of ilm, of knowledge. The next thing we will look at is Al-Wahid and Al-Ahad, the one. And they've both been translated as the one, um, although there is a significant difference, a significant difference between the two, but cannot really be, I suppose, expressed in English, and in one word that is. So he described it as being, he is the one who is single out in all aspects of perfection, such that nothing else shares with him in these. It is obligatory upon the servants to single him out alone in belief, speech and action by acknowledging his unrestricted perfection, his uniqueness, and singling him out alone for all types of worship. And the first verse he quotes is the statement of Yusuf alayhi salam. O two companions of the prison, are many different lords better or Allah the one, the irresistible? Okay, now this word irresistible, okay, uh, here we just, irresistible English has many connotations. Okay, now when you think of irresistible, what thoughts come to your mind? I'm curious, there's one is ice cream. Huh? Ice cream. Ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's what I was expecting actually, something like that. What else? Food, okay? Food is usually, you know, given the description of being irresistible. Irresistible in the sense you cannot resist it. Uh, in Arabic, qahar means something which is so powerful that you cannot resist it. Okay? So, this is a type of, uh, it's more encompassing to the way we understand the word irresistible. Okay? So it's to do power and authority, al-qahar, in Arabic language, we call it qahar, al-wahid al-qahar. This is one of the names we will look at later, inshaAllah. The other verse he quotes, say, I am only a warner, and there is no God except Allah, the one, al-wahid, the irresistible again, al-wahid al-qahar. So it's very interesting how al-wahid here, in both of these <coughs> verses, has been mentioned alongside the name, the irresistible, which is something we need to look at. Al-Wahid has been mentioned in the Qur'an 22 times and Al-Ahad has been mentioned how many times? One time. Okay, one time. And we know where that is mentioned. Surah Al-Ikhlas. Ahad. Now, both are derived from the same root words. Wahada. Wahada. Which means to be one, to be singled out, to be unique. And so the description that the author gave here is very, very befitting. The one who is singled out in all aspects of perfection. So he is the one. Meaning he, all qualities of perfection only lie with him. Not with anybody else. So he is a unique one in that sense. Such that nothing else shares with him in these. As a result of that, he said, it is obligatory upon the servants to single him out alone in belief, speech and action. What does it mean to single out? And this is what we mean by Tawheed. Tawheed comes from this root word. It comes from the, 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 the verb Wahada. Wahada. To make one. Meaning you make your object of worship one. Your object of devotion one. 
The object of your love is one. The object of fear is one. <coughs> Everything is one. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he has created everything else though in pairs. وَمِنْ كُلِّ شَيْنَ خَلَقَنَا زَوْجَيْنِ We have created everything in pairs that you may reflect. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ And from his signs, and خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ And خَلَقَ That from his signs that he created مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَسْوَاجًا He created partners from yourselves. وَمِنْ آيَاتِ But Allah says it's from his ayat. Why is it from his ayat? We've all heard this verse. We've all read it in the wedding invitation cards. We've read it in there. These verses. Why is it from the signs of Allah that he created you in pairs? Everything he created in pairs. Night and day, land and sea. Human beings are created in pairs. You know, the basic chemical structures of protons and neutrons and electrons. Everything's in pairs. Chromosomes. Why? To make you realize that Allah is Al-Wahid. La Sharika Lahu. He has no partner. He has no partner. So everything else is dependent in this dunya upon its pair. So every human being needs its partner. But Allah, La Sharika Lahu. He has no partner. And that's from the ayat of Allah. The fact that He created everything in pairs. Everything. You think about it like, I mean, kulli shay, everything Allah says, Khalaqana Zawjain. We created it. Pets. So, a tawheed, this, this important science of tawheed, of singling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out in worship, meaning you make Allah the sole object, as I said, of your ibadah, not just of matters of belief, but ibadah, hope, love, and fear. Now, what is the difference though between um, the difference between Al-Wahid and Al-Ahd. To understand this, we need to understand a bit of Arabic language. Now, if I say, one student came. How do we say that? Anyone speak Arabic? Ja'a talibun wahidun. Okay? Common mistake, Ja'a wahid talib. This is a mistake. Ja'a talibun wahid. Okay, even Arabs make this mistake. Ja'a talibun wahid. We don't say what ja'a talibun ahad. Okay? Now, if I want to say there is no one in the house, how do you say that? In Arabic, anyone? Hmm? Don't be shy, come on, brothers. We have some Arabs here. That's all I think. Okay, I'll begin it on. La, la ahad fid da, or la ahad fid bait. There is no ahad, there is no one in the house. Now, what's the difference between these two statements? Ja'a talib and wahid, is it affirming something or negating something? Affirming. لا أحد في الدار. There is no one in the house. Affirming or negating. Negating. Now look at this. In Surah Al-Ikhlas, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Qul huwa Allahu Ahad." Say, Allah is the one. Is that in the affirmative or is that negating? It's doing both. And this is the beauty of it. This is why English, sorry, it's a miskine language. It's a very poor language. It cannot accommodate the, the meanings of the Quran. It's affirming because we are affirming oneness, but is negating what? Shirk. Shirk. Why was the surah revealed? The surah was revealed because some people came to Rasulullah and they said, Tell me about your Lord. Is he made of gold or copper? What's his lineage? Where does he come from? <laughs> they were asking these questions. So Allah says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Allah is the one, meaning. All of that you said, that you just mentioned, is all batil. I've negated all of that. Subhanallah. Beautiful, amazing. This Quran. And he, you know, in one word, you you achieve more than one meaning. And this is very unique. I mean, you don't usually find this in normal Arabic speech. So as I said, we use ahad in the negative to negate something. But Allah has used it in the affirmative to establish something, but at the same time to negate something. So this is an extremely powerful way, this surah, and this is why this surah is considered to be 
a third of the Quran is a very powerful way to establish the Tawheed of Allah. Because the oneness of Allah is appreciated when you negate all uh, imperfections from Allah and at the same time you affirm all qualities of perfection. That's why Allah says, kamithlihi shay. There is nothing like unto Allah, wa huwa samirul. Well, see, that He is the all hearing and the all seeing. So Allah has negated, but why is He done straight after that? He has affirmed. La ilaha, negation, illallah, affirmation. That's the way of the believer. We free ourselves from impure states and impure qualities and imperfections, but we adorn ourselves with beauty. Okay, this is, the, 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 this is a common theme you'll find within the religion. In order to pray, what do you need to do first? Before you pray, you need to what? Purify yourself. You need to purify yourself. At-tuhuru shatru al-iman. Purification is half of faith. And that's why some scholars interpreted this to mean that freeing yourself from shirk and kufr is half of faith. So for a believer, if you truly want to understand the essence of tawheed, what must you study and understand? The essence of shirk. And that's why it's very important that we equip ourselves with knowledge of what is shirk so that we are careful not to fall into it. Now many Muslims today, when they look at matters of shirk, they say, well, these are superstitious things, they don't really occur in our communities. Um, I, mean, I would even you know, challenge that. Okay, you know, grave worshipping, this doesn't really take place, this only takes place in villages maybe, and we live in modern societies and what have you. This is the wrong attitude. Really, we have to always, because if generations go on like that, then what will happen? People will become ignorant of basic aspects of shirk. There's one brother, he came up to me and he tried to debate with me about, you know, why we need to establish Khilafah. I saw him a few minutes later reading his star signs. Yeah, I mean, you know, and that's because why we belittle these things. It's Ajib. You know, and so, really, um, to understand the perfection of Tawheed, we need to understand the essence of Shirk. And this is an important point. So, this is the difference between Wahid and Ahad. Wahid is used in the affirmative. And Ahad is used to establish the oneness of Allah, but at the same time negating what? Similar, any form of similarities or uh, any form of imperfection whatsoever. And that's what we see in the Surah, Qul Hu Allahu Ahad, it affirms and negates. Allahu Samad, and Samad is a name, inshaAllah, we might discuss today. Okay? Lam yalid wa lam yulad. Okay, he did not beget nor was he begotten. He didn't give birth nor was he born. So again, affirmation and then negation. And really, Allah Samad Lam Yarid wa Lam Yulad is a type of, is in essence, an explanation to what an Ahad means. If he is Samad, which we will learn is self sufficient, then surely you must direct your worship to him, towards him. And he is Ahad because Lam Yarid wa Lam Yulad. Now here, has an important point we really need to reflect over. I said Al-Wahid has been mentioned in the Qur'an 22 times. Al-Ahad has been mentioned one time in the Qur'an. This establishes, this ratio is very important. This ratio uh, establishes that Islam and the Qur'an as a whole pays more emphasis to establish the qualities of Allah and the attributes of Allah rather than negating um, his imperfect, the, the imperfections that people ascribe to him. Okay? If you look at the Quran, it's full of a description of what Allah subhanahu and who he is. Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum. And then there's negation there. But in most cases, you'll find in the Quran is what? Affirming the qualities of Allah. There are definitely. Verses that negate things from Allah. La ta'khudhu sinatun wa la naum. Okay. He is not overtaken by sleep nor slumber. Laysa kamithin hi shay. There is nothing like unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, that's very, very true. 
but there's more emphasis in the Quran on affirming the qualities of Allah. And this is, this is the correct adab we need to approach with regards to Allah. For example, if you went to a king and he said, Oh Highness, you do not smell, you are not ugly, you are not miserly, you are not poor, you are not greedy. Do you think that king's going to like it? No. How do you praise? You don't praise by simply negating. Okay? Now if you said, O oh, king, you are not miserly, rather you are the all generous. Now that's different. You are negating with the intention of what? To affirm the opposite. And that's a very important principle. Whenever you study the name and attributes of Allah, when Allah negates something from Himself, the idea is to affirm the what? Opposite. Now many people unfortunately have maybe bypassed this principle. And so when they describe Allah, they describe Allah with those sort of qualities. Allah is in no place. There's no direction. Allah cannot, has no color or taste or smell or, you know, these descriptions. And this, these descriptions we don't find in the Quran and Sunnah. To the extent that people end up not knowing what they're worshipping because they've negated everything. So who are they worshipping? And that's why people who have fallen into this, they have run away from anthropomorphism, which is to liken Allah to His creation, and they've fallen into another form of tashbih, anthropomorphism, which is to liken Allah to non-existence. And both are wrong. Both are wrong. Muslims take the middle path. We take the middle path. We affirm what Allah affirms for Himself, and we negate what Allah negates. And we leave it. Now, the... Benefits of knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is um, Al-Ahad and Al-Wahid I believe there's no other beautiful way than to explain the benefit of knowing this other than what Yusuf alayhi salam said to his two companions in the prison In that verse that he quotes O oh, two companions of the prison Are many different lords better or Allah the one the irresistible? If you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, you don't suffer from confusion. Imagine for example you are a servant who has many lords, who has many masters. Who do you go to? One lord tells you to do something, the other lord tells you to do something else. You are running around like a headless chicken with, with, with no sense of direction. This really, I believe, describes the spiritual state of many of us. Now although we say we worship one God, Although we say we have one ilah, we have one Lord, our hearts don't reflect otherwise. Have we seen the one who took his desires as his Lord? Allah says this. Have we seen the one who took his desires as his Lord? So there's this conflict between what we believe but what is within our hearts. We say we worship Allah, we want to live our life as Muslims, but there's many of us worshipping desires and wealth. Our life revolves around wealth. If your life revolves around wealth, you have become an abd to the dinar. You have become a slave to money. It's as simple as that. Your life is meant to revolve around Allah. Your life revolves around Allah. And that's a beautiful thing that you find, you know. And this is something that exists in all universe. You see the planets, they orbit around the sun. We make tawaf, we make tawaf around the Kaaba. And this is to indicate that really our hearts, as some scholars have said, one of the, one of the wisdom, possible wisdoms is that this is to reflect how we want to make our lives revolve around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Revolve around Islam. Al-Wahid, the one. When you make tawaf, you make tawaf around one building. Not around two or three. So your heart can't be in with Allah and then your heart be with somebody else at another time. No, it needs to be de devoted to Al-Wahid and Al-Ahad. And this is the essence of Tawheed, brothers and sisters. It's not just simply knowing the categorizations of different types of Tawheed and that you need to bow and prostrate to Allah only. No, Tawheed is devoting your life to the One. That's the essence of Tawheed. And that's what we need to propagate. And that's the type of Tawheed that really needs to be propagated and passed on to the people. We need to devote our lives to Allah. 
You can be, you can have the most sound understanding of Tawheed, Urubiya, Uluhiya, Asma, and Sifat. You can know everything about Ta'weel, Tashbih, and you can know all of these things, but if your life doesn't revolve around Allah, you haven't truly epitomized the correct understanding of Tawheed. So we need to try and move away just look, looking at Tawheed from an academic perspective and realize what the essence of Tawheed really means. To devote your life to Al-Wahid and Al-Ahid. So this is a very important benefit of knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Wahid and Al-Ahid. And let's move on, inshallah, to the, to the next name, as samad the self-sufficient. Uh, uh, before, we, before we actually do that, um, a few other uh, points I want to mention. Um, obviously, if we know that Allah is al Wahid and al this negates there being any form of similarity between Allah and creation. That's an important point. The fact that He deserves to be worshipped. Uh, there is a negation of any form of taqif or scribing mannerisms to the attributes of Allah. We negate any form of imperfections as we mentioned. And finally, as a beautiful hadith, we know that Aisha reported that there was one companion that when he went on a sariya, like a military expedition, um, he would lead the companions in prayer. But every time he recited the Fatima Surah, he would finish that with Qurbu Allah Muhammad. So he did that in, he did in every Rakhah. So companions, they came back and they were kind of like complaining, like, you know, we haven't, we haven't seen anything like this. And so Rasul said, ask him, for what reason does he do that? And he said, <coughs> he said I love reciting the Surah. I love reciting the Surah. Rasul said, then inform him that Allah truly loves him. Inform him that Allah truly loves him. So, loving this surah is a means by which Allah will love you. So, it's the surah that really deserves deep reflection, deep thought, and to realize what impact it has on your hearts. As Samad is self sufficient. He is the one upon whom the whole of creation relies upon in all of their needs, predicaments, and necessities. This, I suppose I should read, this is due to his unrestricted perfection with regards to his essence, his names, his attributes and his actions. Say he is Allah the One, Allah the Self-Sufficient, Allah the Son. Now, a summit is one of those words which have been described in so many different ways. If you look at books of Tafsir when they explain the Surah, there are a number of different explanations. But as is the case in many cases, we find that um, uh, when Mufassirin, they offer different explanations for one word, these meanings, they do not contradict one another in, in most cases. Okay? They are simply explaining the word from different, from different angles. Okay, so for example, if I was to hold this up, some of you will say that this is what, what is it? Phone. What else can you describe it as? An iPhone. Okay, what else? It's a gadget, a smartphone, or an iPhone with a, with a brown case. Okay, so you can describe it in different ways. So have they contradicted each other with these descriptions? No. So the same will apply to what we're going to look at. So I'll quickly break down and very quickly mention, we're running out of time, the different uh, explanations that scholars have given. So the one explanation is Samad, linguistically in the Arabic language, refers to a, a, a leader who is obeyed amongst his people. A Sayyid al mutar A Sayyid al mutar The one who is obeyed amongst his people. The one whose sovereignty has reached a pinnacle. Also, it was said that The one who has no internal cavity. The one who has no internal cavity. Now you might think, well, that's a massive difference. To describe him as being a Sayyid who is obeyed, 
and someone who has no internal cavity, is there any relationship between the two? Let's, let us move on. Some said he is the one who doesn't eat and drink. The one who doesn't eat and drink. Others describe him as being the one who, and this is the, the most common explanation you'll find, الَّذِي يَسْمَضُ إِلَيْهِ يُسْمَضُ إِلَيْهِ فِي الْحَوَاجِ And he is the one who people turn to for to fulfill their needs. But he is the one who does not need anything else. So, so far we've given how many meanings? says, a Sayyidin Muta'ah, the one who's obeyed, <coughs> who, whose sovereignty has reached the pinnacle. Secondly, the one who um, has no internal cavity, doesn't eat and drink, and the one who the one who people turn to to fulfill their needs whilst he has no needs for anybody else. All of these refer to the one fundamental meaning, which is what? That Allah is in need of no one, but everyone is in need of Allah. Allah is in need of no one, but we are all in need of Allah. Let's show you. So, as Sayyid al Mutar, the one who is obeyed, the one who is obeyed amongst his people, does he need to go to anybody? Does he need to um, respond to any, anybody in the sense that he has, to, he has someone to answer to? No. People come to him. People come to him for wealth, distribution of wealth, etc. The one who has no internal cavity. Now we have internal cavities, isn't it? We have like the brain, we have the, the lungs, we have the stomach. And what are the functions of these organs to help us live, isn't it? The stomach. The stomach needs what? Food. Our lungs, they need air. Okay? We need all, that's why we have these internal cavities, because we are in need of them. So someone who has no internal cavities suggests what? He has no needs. Okay, he has no needs. And likewise, the one who doesn't eat and drink, he, Allah, he, he has no need to eat and drink because he's in no need of that. So this is the essential meaning of a summit. The one who is turned to for help and, and assistance, but he, at the same time, is in need of nobody or anything. <coughs> After knowing this, what are the important effects? We know that as a result of that, we should always be turning to Allah. And we should realize that the nature of the human being is that he is in a state where he is in need of his Creator. And that we are not independent individuals and human beings that can live our lives based on our own accord. We need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our lives. If you think you don't need Allah, you're fooling yourself and you're just destroying yourself spiritually. And even when you think you don't need Allah, in reality, Allah is still seeing to all of your needs. Like the kuffar, they say, oh, we don't need God in our lives. We're fine about God in our lives. But God is already in your life. He's providing for you. He's providing for you. He's taking care of you. So you cannot take God out of your life as they think. He's a part of your life whether you recognize it or not. So the heart should therefore realize their state of weakness when, you, when we say Allah is a summit. Your, you, your heart should recognize that you are faqir in Allah. Ya ayyuhun nas, or my kind, antum al fuqara'u in Allah. You are in a state of poverty to Allah. Wallahu al ghani al hamid. Okay, so this ends our discussion on our summit, and I think that we will end on that point for today, inshaAllah. Um,